Thank you, Barbara. Hi, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. My name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. So, so far, we've read the doctor's opinion where we found out that we have an allergy to alcohol. We have a drink. We can't stop with one. We have to have more. Then we read Bill's story, which is a story of a guy who just started out having a couple of beers at a party one day. And the next thing you know, he alcohol was his master. He went through hell with alcoholism. And with the help of a couple of friends, found his way to a solution. And he briefly told us about that solution. And then we read There Is a Solution, a chapter called There Is a Solution. And that talked about more about alcoholism, the disease, <clears throat> and classified and described uh, an alcoholic to us. What is an alcoholic? And it, it gave us a definition of that. It also introduced the real solution to alcoholism that we in Alcoholics Anonymous adopt and hold dear to our hearts. And now we're going to, we're getting into chapter three called More About Alcoholism. It's going to tell us a lot of stories, a lot of little examples of what happened with certain alcoholics. And uh, we're going to learn more about alcoholism than we need to know. And then we're going to go on to a chapter called We Agnostic. And that's going to talk about the solution in depth. And it's probably one of the greatest spiritual writings you'll ever read. So tonight we're starting chapter three, more about alcoholism, page 30. This is something we read every single night in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Most groups read this every night. And we read it over and over and over and over again. And yet there's still things that you see in it once in a while when it's explained to you that you didn't recognize ever before. So it's always good to go through a real close look at it. So it starts off, the first paragraph says, most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. Now, if we look at that carefully, we see that Bill is talking about this insanity that happens just before the first drink. And like he always does, he uses more than one word that mean the same thing to try to get a point across in our head. And, and insanity or sanity is being whole-minded. So your whole mind is functioning properly. Then you're sane. You hear alcoholics say that they're crazy. You should have seen the stuff I did. I did some really crazy stuff when I was drinking. Well, that's not because they're insane. It's because that's what alcohol does to you. It makes you do crazy stuff. We always got in trouble. We always did things that, oh my God, if we did, we're so embarrassed about it the next day. But we did it in full glory the night before. So that was all because we had the first drink and drank some more alcohol. The alcohol makes us do crazy stuff. But that's not the insanity that Bill talks about. Insanity is when you're, you don't have a whole mind. And what, it, what it's really talking about is when you begin to believe something that's not true. You're insane if there's a truth that you don't believe and choose something else to believe. That's the insanity of it. And he uses a couple of words here. He goes, the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. Well, the obsession to drink is not while we're drinking, it's before we drink, we have that obsession. And we believe that with that obsession that we just have to have a drink, but that's not true. So an obsession is a form of insanity. It's you're not whole-minded when you make a decision based on an obsession to pick up a drink, you're insane. 
And then the next sentence, it says, the persistence of this illusion. Well, we know what an illusion is. A magician does a trick. And right there in front of us, he makes us believe something is true that's not true. And that's what the magic trick is, is that it's not really true. And so an illusion is not true. Okay. Then it talks about insanity or death, which is, you know, we pursue this illusion and this obsession to the gates of insanity where we don't have our whole mind working for us. And then in the second paragraph, he talks about a delusion. And a delusion is also something that's not true, but you believe it's true. So this whole part of the beginning is talking about the insanity of drinking is because we believe something is not true. And that first sentence, most of us have been unwilling to admit we're real alcoholics. Well, if we're not admitting it, we're not telling the truth. Because everybody else in the world, while I was drinking, everybody in the world knew I was an alcoholic but me. I was the only one that was denying it. I was the only one that said it wasn't true. That's untrue, that we had to have a drink, that we drank that, that we're not admitting that we're alcoholics. And then, uh, so we pursued this forever. No matter what happened, we always thought a drink would help, and it never did. It never helped because once we had one, we had too many, got too drunk and caused more problems than we had when we started drinking. So it goes on into the second paragraph. And this is an incredible paragraph. You should remember second paragraph, page 30 is a paragraph you should remember and memorize and know it's there. It says, we learned we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. It's a delusion that we are like other people. We talked about it already for the week's past that we are abnormal drinkers. We are abnormal people. The normal people can have one drink and go home. We're abnormal. We can have one drink and go home. We have to drink more. So we're the abnormal ones. And then it says we have to fully concede to our innermost selves. It doesn't say we have to admit to the room of Alcoholics Anonymous. It doesn't say we have to admit it to our sponsors. Of course, we will and we do every night, but that's not that doesn't mean that's not the first step in recovery to admit, admit it to somebody else. The first step in recovery is to admit it to your innermost self, not even your superficial self. You know, can't you? Yeah, I'm an alcoholic. You know, that's not it. You got to get down inside of your soul and recognize the fact that you are an alcoholic, that you have an allergy and an obsession of the mind. And the mind is going to make you drink unless you admit it deep down inside and get to the core issue of why you have that obsession. And that's the first step in recovery. And then it says the delusion that we are like other people or presently may be, presently may be means soon, soon will be, has to be smashed. It doesn't say it has to be forgotten or left alone. It says smashed. That delusion that we are like other people, we have to come to grips with the fact that as alcoholics, we are not like 90% of the world. We're just not like all those other people. So we have to get rid of that illusion that we can drink like other people or that we are like other people because we're not. And we have to admit that to our innermost selves. You're not doing it. You're not admitting that you're an alcoholic because everybody else wants you to. That's not good enough. Because I could say that and still drink and not mean it. So you got to get down inside yourself so you mean it when you say you're an alcoholic. All right. It says, we alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. Word control. 
we know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control. All of us felt at times that we were regaining control. But such intervals, usually brief, were inevitably followed by a still less control, which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. We are convinced to a man that alcoholics of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. Over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. So if you think that you can still drink a little bit more, that you don't have to quit now, not a good idea. If you have the opportunity to quit and get sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, do so without hesitation. Don't talk yourself into like, well, I'll do it next year. You know, I'll wait until after the holiday. Or my birthday's coming up. I'll wait until after my birthday, then I'll quit. Don't put it off. If you have the idea that you that that alcohol is bothering you and is affecting your life in a way you don't want it to, then quit. Quit and, and find out how to quit and find out how to stay sober. Find out what it takes. And that's what we're going to do in here is tell you what it takes. Remember always, it is a progressive illness. Most people start out drinking a little bit. They go out on a Friday night or a Saturday night and get a little buzz on. You know, then a month later, they're going out on Saturday night and getting pretty, pretty drunk. And the next time, then it's Thursday night and Friday night and Saturday night and Sunday night, they're getting drunk. And then soon enough, it's every day they have something to drink. They might get not get fall down drunk, but they're going to drink every day. It progresses, progresses. So eventually it turns to the point like it did in myself that I drank constantly all day, every day, every chance I had. I always had booze with me or on me and I drank all the time. I drank at work. I drank at home. I drink it, drank at play. Everything I did, I drank. I went grocery shopping. I was drunk when I went. I was always drinking. And it's, it got that way because I didn't always drink like that. It just got like that. And then it finally got to the place where I thought I was going to die. So that's when I had to make a decision. It says, we are like men who have lost their legs. They never grow new ones. Neither does there appear to be any kind of treatment which will make alcoholics of our kind like other men. There's no treatment that make us non-alcoholic. We can't fix alcoholic. We can quit drinking. We can live a sober life. We can do that. But we're always going to have the disease of alcoholism. And it always needs treatment. We have to treat our alcoholism every day. And it's going to be with us forever. We have to just accept that. He says, uh, in some instances, there has been brief recovery, followed always by a still worse relapse. Physicians who are familiar with alcoholism agree that there is no such thing as making a normal drinker out of an alcoholic. Science may one day accomplish this, but it hasn't done so yet. Well, what if it did? What if they came out with a pill tomorrow that if we took the pill, and we didn't get drunk, could we drink? Well, earlier we read that alcoholics drink mostly for the effect. We don't drink for the taste. I've never heard anybody say beer tastes good or gin. Gin doesn't taste good, has a great effect, but it tastes like lighter fluid. So if they made a pill that if we took the pill and we drank gin and didn't get drunk, why would we drink the gin? There would be no point in drinking anymore if they cured us of alcoholism. If we weren't getting the effect of alcohol, I wouldn't bother with it. The only reason I drank 
was to get drunk. I didn't do it for any other reason but to get drunk. And if you take that away, then I wouldn't drink the stuff. So we're not looking for a cure. We're not looking for that because it's still going to be, we're not going to drink. We're going to still have the obsession to drink because that's in our mind. And a pill that takes care of our body is not going to fix that obsession in the mind. So it's not going to help us if, it, if they do come up with a, with a cure. Despite all we can say, many who are real alcoholics are not going to believe that they are in that class. That is not an alcohol problem. That's a mind problem. Not a body problem. It's a mind problem. They just won't admit that they're alcoholics. They won't believe that they're in the class of alcoholics, therefore abnormal and different in mind and body from other people. Alcoholics just don't want to admit that. By every form of self-deception and experimentation, they will try to prove themselves exceptions to the rule, therefore non-alcoholic. So people are out there drinking and getting drunk to prove to you that they're not alcoholics. Not much chance of that working. If anyone who is showing inability to control his drinking can do the right about face and drink like a gentleman, our hats are off to him. Heaven knows we have tried hard enough and long enough to drink like other people. But we can't because they're not like other people. We are alcoholics and we are different. And someday that has to sink into your head that an alcoholic is, if you're alcoholic, you're different from 90% of the people. You just have to let that sink into your head. Make that become a truth within your soul that you're an alcoholic. We fight it long and hard. We don't want to admit it. We fight it long and hard. But eventually, we have to give in to that idea. So go ahead and give in to that idea. Don't waste time. Here are some of the methods we have tried. Drinking only beer. Limiting the number of drinks. Never drinking alone. Never drinking in the morning. Drinking only at home. Never having it in the house. Never drinking during business hours. Drinking only at parties, switching from scotch to brandy, drinking only natural wines, agreeing to resign if ever drunk on the job, taking a trip, not taking a trip, swearing off forever with or without a solemn oath, taking more physical exercise, reading inspirational books, going to health farms and sanitariums accepting voluntary commitment to asylums, we could increase the list ad infinitum. So we can try all we want to. We can do all of those things, and I've done a lot of those things. We can try them all and more than that. But it's not gonna it's not gonna change the fact that we're alcoholics. It's not good we're not gonna stay doing those things. You're not going to only drink beer, and you're not going to only drink at home. You know, if you're if you're a person that goes out to the bars, you say, "Well, I'm not going to go to the bars. I'm only drink at home." You're not going to get any less drunk at home. So I've done it. You're going to get just as drunk at home. When I was out in Kansas, I used to drink three two beer, not the seven percent beer, the three point two percent beer, because I said, "Well, only half the alcohol. I won't get drunk." Well. I drank twice as many cans of beer because I was going to get that drunk. It would have been better to drink the seven because it would be cheaper. But I said, nope, because I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not going to drink like that. But I did. I just drank more and more and more and more. That didn't stop just because I tried some new idea. I was still an alcoholic and still acted like an idiot. We do not like to pronounce any individual an alcoholic, but you can quickly diagnose yourself. Step over to the nearest bar room, 
and try some controlled drinking. Try to drink and stop abruptly. Try more than once. It will not take long for you to decide if you are honest with yourself about it. It may be worth a bad case of jitters if you get a full knowledge of your condition. While it's suggested that you do that, I would suggest you not do that. Just take some of us, take our word for it. You know, controlled drinking. Remember that paragraph before I kept saying control, control, control. You know, we never regain control. We've lost the ability to control our drinking. So if you're going to go try some controlled drinking, know that it's not, doesn't work. But you'll learn something. All right, so on page 32, first full paragraph. Though there is no way of proving it, we believe that early in our drinking careers, most of us could have stopped drinking. But the difficulty is that few alcoholics have enough desire to stop while there is yet time. We have heard of a few instances where people who showed definite signs of alcoholism were able to stop for a long period because of an overpowering desire to do so. And they're going to give us an example of that. So yeah, some people that just start drinking and then they get too drunk on the weekends early on, maybe go out three or four times and every time they're puking on their sneakers and feeling terrible, they come home and say, that's it, I quit. But they're not alcoholics. So they can quit. They were drinking. They're normal people who drank too much. They're not alcoholics who had the obsession and the allergy. So they could quit. If they didn't quit when they did, like it, it says there that some people just kept on drinking, they could have quit, but they kept on drinking. And then when it gets time where they realize, uh-oh, I'm really getting messed up. I better quit now. They find out that it's too late then. They have become alcoholics. By having that alcohol in their body all the time, they've developed that allergy. And now they're real alcoholics. And they can't control themselves. So we're going to read about this guy. Pretty a sad case, actually. A man of 30 was doing a great deal of spree drinking. He was very nervous in the morning after these bouts and quiet himself with more liquor. He was ambitious to succeed in business, but he saw that he would get nowhere if he drank at all. Once he started, he had no control whatever. He made up his mind that until he had been successful in business and had retired, he would not touch another drop. An exceptional man. He remained bone dry for 25 years and retired at the age of 55 after a successful and happy business career. Then he fell victim to the belief, which practically every alcoholic has, that his long period of sobriety and self-discipline had qualified him to drink as other men. But there's a problem. Out came his carpet slippers and a bottle. In two months, he was in the hospital, puzzled and humiliated. He tried to regulate his drinking for a while, making several trips to the hospital meantime. Then, gathering all his forces, he attempted to stop altogether and found he could not. Every means of solving his problem, which money could buy, was at his disposal. Every attempt failed. Though a robust man at retirement, he went to pieces and pieces quickly and was dead within four years. That's sad. Here's a guy who could quit. He quit for 25 years. But then for some reason, some insane thought made him think that because I haven't drank in 25 years, I can drink like a normal person. And he tried it and it didn't work. And when it didn't work, he, he still drank. And then it got to the point he couldn't help but drink. And the next thing you know, he's in the hospital so many times and just drank so much that 
in a mere four years. Can you imagine being sober for 25 years and it only took you four years to get so drunk it killed you? Things didn't work out for that guy. So you see that in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous occasionally. I know a guy who had 20 years, never had a drink, had 20 years, upstanding member of AA, and got real busy at work and stopped coming to meetings. Well, he's busy at work and it was in an administrative job and they had parties and this and that. Next thing you know, the guy picked up a drink. And he had a tendency to also imbibe in a little drugs at the time. So he was drinking and doing some drugs and stayed out for five years and came back like a wreck of a man. He was, it, it, it ruined his life. I mean, he was in good health when he left and was in miserable health when he came back. And he messed up his eyes, his kidneys, everything. He really messed up. But he thought he could drink again. Went 20 years without drinking in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Helped many people quit drinking. And they're still sober, but he went out. I know other guys, 14 years, went out. 12 years, went out. Five years, went out. Because they won't put that idea in their head and smash the delusion that they're alcoholic, period. It's going to be for the rest of your life you're an alcoholic. There's no joke about it. There's no changing that. There's nothing you can do. You're an alcoholic. If you're a real alcoholic, you can never drink again. But we can't get that in our head. People admit it to other people, but not to themselves. That's why that second paragraph is so critically important in our recovery. Is we had to concede to our innermost selves. We don't do that. And we always think that we're good. I made it. I got time. I'm not going to drink. And that's usually right before they drink. So we have to be careful. We have to constantly remind ourselves that we're alcoholics. Ever. We can treat it every day. We don't have to drink. We can not drink one day at a time. But it's one day at a time because that one day that you decide that you're going to have a drink could kill you. It killed this guy. Killed this guy within just two months. He was already back in the hospital. And four years later, he's dead. So he had a miserable four years. He retires and was miserable until he died. After all that work that he did to retire and get ready. So it's, it's, it's pitiful. Young people may be encouraged by this man's experience to think that they can stop, as he did, on their own willpower. We doubt if many of them can do it because none will really want to stop. And hardly one of them, because of a peculiar mental twist already acquired, will find he can win out. Several of our crowd, men of 30 or less, had been drinking only a few years, but they found themselves as helpless as, as those who had been drinking 20 years. So there's no formulation for this disease. Some people, have, you're born with the allergy. And so the first time they drink, they get drunk and they love it and they keep on drinking until it kills them. Other people have to drink for years and years and years before they become an alcoholic. And before it catches up to them, and then they become an alcoholic and they say, whoa, this is getting bad. I better quit. And then they can't. It's too late. So be excited when you see somebody that can, can quit. You've got to quit. It's an individual thing that everybody has to do. You just have to always keep in mind, you're an alcoholic. Don't ever forget it. Remind yourself in a, in a bathroom mirror every day. You know, go in that mirror and say, okay, buddy, I'm an alcoholic. Make sure you know that. To be gravely affected, one does not necessarily have to drink for a long time, nor take the quantity some of us have. This is particularly true of women. 
potential female alcoholics often turn into the real thing and are gone beyond recall in a few years. Certain drinkers who would be greatly insulted if called alcoholics are astonished at their inability to stop. We who are familiar with the symptoms see large numbers of potential alcoholics among young people everywhere, but try and get them to see it. So this was back in 2011. The footnote says that United States and Canadian membership survey showed about one thirteenth of AAs were 30 and under. Imagine that. 26 people in the room and only two of them are under 30. So it was an old man's club for sure in the beginning. And then some young people started realizing that they were in trouble and started coming in. It's still a very small amount. Thank God it seems that we have more than that now. Young people think they're, you know, indestructible. They think it's not going to hurt them. They just don't, unless they get in trouble, unless they do something really horrifying, they don't try to quit. They think their bodies are young enough they can tolerate it. And we see it all the time. So as we look back, we feel we had gone on drinking many years beyond the point where we could quit on our willpower. If anyone questions whether he has entered this dangerous area, let him try leaving liquor alone for one year. If he is a real alcoholic and very far advanced, there is a scant chance of success. In the early days of our drinking, we occasionally remained sober for a year or more, becoming serious drinkers again later. Though you may be able to stop for a considerable period, you may yet be a potential alcoholic. We think few to whom this book will appeal can stay dry anything like a year. Some will be drunk the day after making their resolutions, most of them within a few weeks. In my earlier years, I got involved with the church and they frowned upon drinking, smoking, all that stuff. And so I quit drinking while I was involved in the church. I, I quit drinking for two years. Then I kind of left the church. I wasn't going to the church much and I was working on the road a lot. And I was out working on the road. And I went to a bar as the designated driver for my crew. And I took them out and I went to the bar with them and I was having Pepsi. And there's beer mugs all over the place. They're having Pepsi. And I hadn't had a drink for two years and was not planning on it that night. But I reached over when I was talking to somebody and picked up the wrong mug. Grabbed it, threw a big swig down my throat, and it was beer. Now, after two years, you would have thought I would have spit it out and said, oh, my God, this stuff tastes terrible, and been done with it. Instead. I drank that one, got another one, and another, and another, and I drank them really fast. And within a half an hour, after two years of being sober on my own willpower, I was drunk and beaten up and robbed in an alleyway 30 minutes later. It took 30 minutes to be so unconscious and so unable to take care of myself, that I was beat mercilessly and robbed in a half an hour. So I know this is true. I did it. It was hard staying sober, but I liked staying sober. And it was an accident. But was it really? You know, that obsession of the mind puts you in places you shouldn't be. So I went in there and I and ended up drinking. And that drinking got me beat up. and. I went right back into the bar when I woke up. I went right back in the bar and drank for the rest of the night. And that was it. And I've been drinking ever since until I came to AA and got sober. 
So believe me. And and that relapse, which wasn't a relapse, I wasn't in AA, but when I started drinking again, I mean, I drank heavier than ever from then on. That two-year period of sobriety put me at a level. When I went back, I went back full tilt every day, all day, even worse than before, and started having all kinds of physical problems and all that stuff, was getting beat up, getting hurt, getting damaged all the time. You know, my liver was shot, my kidneys were shot. You know, I was messed up, but I kept drinking. So for those who are unable to drink moderately, the question is how to stop altogether. We are assuming, of course, that the reader desires to stop. Whether such a person can quit upon a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent to which he has already lost the power to choose whether he will drink or not. Now, it points out there that if you can quit on a non-spiritual basis, it's a solid true fact you can quit no matter how bad you are you can quit on a spiritual basis you can't quit on a non-spiritual basis and that's setting us up for step two which we'll read when we get into the next chapter we can't do it with human help we get beyond human help nobody can help us we can't help ourselves and we get wrecked Many of us felt we had plenty of character. There was a tremendous urge to cease forever, yet we found it impossible. This is the baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it. This utter inability to leave it alone, no matter how great the necessity or the wish. So a doctor can tell you, you know, your liver's falling out, you got to quit drinking. The doctor can tell you, you can't have any more booze, but you'll keep on drinking. And you can want to quit as hard as you possibly can. You can really want it and still not be able to quit because of the obsession of the mind. This is a disease that lasts forever. So let's stop there. Next week, we're going to read about two or three more examples of what happens when people lose control and uh, it gets very interesting we'll, we'll we'll read some stories about we'll read about jim i love jim that story is amazing you'll all love it so we'll get to jim's story next week. thank you very much back to you barbara